Hello, my name is Jason Georges of HonorShame.com. This is a webinar about honor and shame in historical theology. In the last 30 years, an awareness of honor and shame has increased, especially in anthropology and psychology. The social sciences have really exposed shame and exalted honor. But unfortunately, honor and shame are less prominent in Christian theology and missiology. You see, the church has been slow to explain the gospel from an honor-shame perspective. And I believe we must develop an honor-shame theology. This is an explanation of biblical truths according to the moral logic and social values of collect collectivistic societies. This is a, a theological framework or a biblical worldview for Christian ministry in honor-shame contexts. But because honor-shame cultures vary so widely, there's not one universal honor-shame theology. So we're going to look at some examples and methods from church history that can help us develop an honor-shame theology in our contemporary context. So we will look at honor and shame in historical theology to examine some pictures of honor-shame theology from the past. That way we can learn from their techniques and ideas and their uh, approach to the Bible to get ideas and inspiration for our contemporary context. Now understand that contemporary scholarship offers many great insights about honor and shame, but the idea of honor and shame did not start in the 20th century with Ruth Benedict or Bruce Molina. In fact, theologians throughout church history have explained biblical truth in honor-shame terms. Historical theology really lets us stand on the shoulders of giants instead of starting at ground zero as we try to develop an honor-shame theology. So in this webinar, I examine how eight prominent theologians addressed eight theological doctrines in honor-shame terms. I will briefly summarize each author's contribution towards an honor-shame theology in this sequence here of systematic theology, and I will try to use their words as much as possible. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople in the 4th century, was famous for his eloquent preaching. His 88 exegetical homilies on the Gospel of John really read like a social science commentary, and so I'll explain a few ways that honor and shame shaped his interpretation of Scripture. 1. Chrysostom references honor-shame dynamics to expound the theology of the Incarnation in John 1. Chrysostom says that John opens with the pre-existence of God's word because, quote, he knows that men most honor the eldest of beings, which was before all. And Chrysostom was adamant that the language of sonship does not imply any inferiority of Jesus to the Father, but rather the Apostle John used the expression son because he was, quote, very confident that between the Father and Son there was an equality of honor. Chrysostom describes the Incarnation as a king conferring honor upon the lowly. Quote, a king conversing with interest and kindness with a poor or mean man does not at all shame himself as the king, yet he makes the other person observed by all and illustrious. Chrysostom's comments on John 1 explain the Incarnation as the embodiment and divine revel revelation of honor. Also, Chrysostom's homilies exhort listeners to appropriate God's honor. For Chrysostom, the text of John should refashion our honor quote. These quotes here illustrate Chrysostom's reflection on the nature of true honor that should be formed as we encounter scripture. Quote, Beloved, let us be sensible of the nobility which he ha has given to us. Let us despise vulgar applause, for nothing is so ridiculous and disgraceful as vainglory. To love honor is dishonor, and that true honor consists in neglecting honor. Or another quote, Look straight up to God. He will praise you, and the man who is approved by him must not seek honor from mortals. And finally, if an earthly king approves you, you make no account of the many, though they all deride you. But if the Lord of the universe praise you, do you seek the good words of beetles and gnats? But this is what these men are compared to God that you seek honor from. Chrysostom's homilies on John provide a great model for hermeneutics and homiletics from an honor-shame perspective. Jonathan Edwards was a Puritan pastor and Reformed theologian in early New England. His book, The End for Which God Created the World, provides a radically God-centered view of the world. Edwards argues, both philosophically and biblically, that the ultimate end of God and of all history is the magnification of God's supreme glory. The language of honor pervades Edwards' theology. He could speak about honor eight different ways in one sentence. 
here he says, if God's own excellency and glory is worthy to be highly valued and delighted in him, then the value and esteem hereof by others is worthy to be regarded by him. Edwards claims, all that is ever spoken of in the scriptures as the ultimate end of God's work is included in one phrase, the glory of God. The glory of God signifies the emanation and true expression of God's internal glory. For Edwards, God is morally disposed towards his own glory. God's innate disposition towards honor is not dishonorable or unworthy because he should value himself infinitely more than his creatures. God should and does seek his own glory. And this glory is not static, but it actively overflowing into creation for all of eternity. And so glory involves three aspects. An internal excellency, the public exhibition of that internal quality, and then the honor that is paid back to God from creatures in the form of praise. So in sum, God has glory, displays glory, and then gets glory, and that process goes forever. Now God's own joy in his glorious fullness disposes him to exhibit his glory in creation so that his glory is further known and then cherished by others. God loves to have himself valued and esteemed, said Edwards. God's own delight in his internal glory disposes him to exhibit that glory in all things, in providence, creation, redemption, and all of eternity. Edwards argues how God's glory and human happiness are one end and the same. Our joyous praising of God acknowledges his glory. Or, to quote, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Christian holiness means the heart exalting, magnifying, and glorifying God. And the magnification of God's supreme glory continues unabated into eternity according to Edwards. The end for which God created the world has no end. His glory abounds forever. Jonathan Edwards, really like no other theologian, offers a radical vision of God's supreme honor in all things. From eternity past to eternity future, the ultimate end of all things is the glory of God. And in this way, Edwards provides a philosophical and biblical cornerstone for a Christian theology of God in honor-shame terms. Sir Thomas Watson was a Puritan pastor in 17th century England. Though a famous preacher and author, he was ejected from the church for dissenting against the king, and his book, The Doctrine of Repentance, offers an extensive shame-based homardiology. Watson explains the centrality of shame in both sin and repentance, which I will summarize here in five points. One, sh sin brings shame upon God. He says, sin is an offense to God. What greater injury can be given to a prince than to trample on his royal edicts? Sin robs God of his due. See how scripture has penciled sin out. It dishonors God, despises God, and enrages God, said Watson. Two, sin belittles Christ. That is, our iniquity is the reason Jesus bore the shame on the cross. But also, our perpetual unbelief, our perpetual unbelief undercuts the glory of the cross. He said, we have affronted and disparaged Christ's blood by unbelief. Or sin, when acted to its height, crucifies Christ afresh and puts him to open shame. Then thirdly, sin makes people shameful before God. Sin brings disgrace into our lives. He says sin is a debasing thing. It degrades a person of his honor, and nothing so changes a man's glory into shame as sin. And he said, sin has made us naked and deformed in God's eyes. But then fourth, true repentance requires a holy shaming. Healthy shame is essential for believers, but impossible for unbelievers. He says, when the heart has been made black with sin, grace makes the face red with blushing. I am ashamed and blush to lift my face, quoting Ezra 9. Repentance causes a holy bashfulness. If Christ's blood were not in the sinner's heart, there would be so much blood in the sinner's face. How far from being penitent are those who have no shame? Many have sinned away shame. Quoting Zephaniah 3, The unjust knows no shame. It is a great shame not to be ashamed, and there is no creature capable of shame but man, 
but those who cannot blush for sin too much resemble the beast. And Watson's fifth point is that repentance, true repentance, repairs the problem of shame. God's shame, our shame, and our shamelessness. He says, by sin we have wronged God. We have eclipsed his honor. But by repentance, we give glory to God, and we do what lies in us in order to repair his honor. So let us show our penitence by a modest blushing. Oh, let us take holy shame to ourselves for sin. In Watson's theology, shame is foremost a spiritual and theological concept. It defines our vertical relationship with God, but also he offers a profound explanation of the role of shame in repentance. Our holy shame repairs the honor of God. Athanasius was the bishop of Alexandria and leader of the Nicene Council in the 4th century. He said, God became man so that man might become God. This quote here summarizes the orthodox soteriology of theosis, meaning divinization or deification. And in this view, salvation involves becoming like God and sharing his divine nature. Athanasius explained, The word was made flesh in order that we might become gods. And just as the Lord, putting on the body, became a man, so also we men are both deified through the flesh and inherit everlasting life. This sonship implies an entirely new mode of being, not only a legal status. However, theosis is never a matter of actual substance. Athanasius himself contrasted the natural sonship of the Logos, Jesus, with our adoptive sonship, which is given by grace. So theosis involves a deliverance from mortality, participation in the life of God, and renewal of the original Imago Dei. This is the appropriation of divine status as biblical salvation. Now keep in mind, many other church fathers assumed and advocated the soteriology of theosis. For, exam for example, Augustine of Hippo said, But he himself that justifies also deifies, for by justifying he makes sons of God. And Ephraim the Syrian, who is the 4th century father of Syriac Christianity, links deification with honor and shame. He explains about salvation. Quote, Among the saints their nakedness is clothed with glory. None is clad with leaves or stands in ashamed. For they have found through the Lord the robe of glory that belongs to Adam and Eve. So how does theosis relate to honor and shame? Well, theosis perceives sin as a fall from honor, a stripping of glory, and a loss of communion. So salvation in this framework is a re-honoring that's accomplished by a restoration of that image and accompanying honor that comes from being included in fellowship with the Trinity. So theosis is like divinization. Becoming like God involves regaining our original status of honor and appropriating God's face. Or according to John 17, 22, we share his glory. As Cyril of Alexandria explained, to be sons and gods by grace is to have this wonderful and supernatural dignity. Theosis is the salvific process of fully participating in God's honor. Despite some Western skepticism of Eastern theology, the doctrine of theosis offers a potential soteriology for honor-shame cultures today that's worth considering. So if that is the nature of salvation, how does God bring about that salvation through the atonement? Well, Anselm was a Benedictine monk and Archbishop of Canterbury in the uh, 11th and 12th century. His greatest work, Curdeus Homo, employs scholastic reasoning to explain the atonement of the God-man, Jesus. But later, Reformed scholars from the 1600s on repackage Anselm's satisfaction theory into the commonly known penal substitutionary atonement model. However, we must read Curdeus Homo in light of the medieval feudal values of honor and shame, not the legal values of later reformers. So looking at Elmsdelm's theology of the atonement, he said, first, all creatures must be subordinate to the will of God, for when a rational nature wills what it ought to, it honors God. Man owes glory and honor to God, but we often fail in this obligation. Quote, whoever does not pay to God the honor that is due him, dishonors him and removes from him what belongs to him. And this removal or this dishonoring constitutes a sin. 
And so consequently, everyone who sins is obliged to repay to God the honor which is stolen. An honor repayment is essential because God can never tolerate that the creature remove the honor that's owed to him as God and not repay that. God's honor must be satisfactorily satisfactorily repaid because, quote, God keeps nothing more justly than the honor of his dignity. God is constrained to save for his own sake because he is, quote, under the necessity of maintaining his honor. So God can't forgive apart from any repayment of the stolen honor. But we humans are incapable of repaying our own honor debt. You see, our good deeds and our worship is what we already owe God, so they can't be used as a back payment for previous insults to his honor. So then, Jesus Christ, the God-man, is a complete satisfaction of sin. For Anselm, this means Jesus' sacrificial life repays our debt of honor. His life is paid to God for the sins of men as a gift that brings honor to God, not simply a victim that absorbs punishment. Because Jesus was sinless, he could freely give himself over to death for the honor of God. And quote, he paid on behalf of sinners that which he did not already owe himself, the honor debt which we owe God. Jesus' life was an infinite gift of honor to God on our behalf. Now repayment of our honor debt happens so that punishment does not happen. For example, in banking, a debtor who repays does not face consequences. And in Anselm's words, it is necessary either for honor that has been removed to be repaid or for punishment to result. But unfortunately, the God-man has justly honored God for us and removed any need for punishment. Anselm's satisfaction theory explains the atonement in terms of honor and shame. Though it's not perfect, his model can be helpful for explaining the cross today in honor-shame context. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German dissident and theologian, speaks about shame in his book, Ethics. The context of Bonhoeffer's reflection was World War II Germany, a time when the church lost her prophetic and moral vision. Bonhoeffer first analyzes the role of shame in the divine human relationship. People perceive their disunion from God, and this causes shame in us. Quote, shame is man's ineffaceable recollection of his estrangement from the origin. Man is ashamed of the loss of his unity with God and with other men. But for Bonhoeffer, the human response of covering and concealing shame is actually redemptive. He says covering is necessary because it keeps awake shame, and with it the memory of the disunion with the origin, that is God. Bonhoeffer thought shame was was a necessary reminder of our longing to be reunited with God, not just some artificial mass to be stripped away. And the shame of isolation is overcome through reunion and restoration. He says shame can only be overcome when the original unity is restored, when man is once again clothed by God. But to overcome that shame, we must endure the ultimate shame, according to Bonhoeffer. And that is to make ourselves fully exposed to God by confessing our sins. And because shame is a primal element in human theology, it must also be central in our social ethics. Bonhoeffer, understand, was skeptical about the human conscience, that internal conviction of wrongdoing, because he thought that human conscience was concerned not with man's relation to God, but with other man's relationship to himself. And since rules are always defined as either permitted or forbidden, our conscience defines morality as simply legal or illegal, (coughs) as regulated by the state, not in terms of good or bad, as defined by God. So for Bonhoeffer, our conscience is not God's law written on our hearts, but it was more like an echo chamber of idolatrous humans. Shame, he proposed, was a better moral force than conscience or guilt for two reasons. One, shame was more elemental or primal than remorse because it goes all the way back to our disunion with God. And two, shame affects the whole of life, not just certain actions regulated by legality. For Bonhoeffer, shame plays a prominent role in ethics, and this is much needed in global Christianity today. Ignatius was bishop of Antioch around the year 100 AD. In route to his execution in Rome, Ignatius wrote seven letters about his looming martyrdom, and I note two points about his theology of suffering. 
One, Ignatius redefines martyrdom for the sake of Christ as something that's honorable. He says about his circumstances, I have been judged worthy to bear a most godly name. His own execution demonstrates that, quote, I have been judged worthy of serving the honor of God. Ignatius sought to follow the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, who was approved and, quote, worthy of honor. Because in Ignatius's mind, to be publicly executed for Christ's sake was more honorable than to rule the world. In fact, he actually rode ahead to the church in Rome so that they might not interfere with his martyrdom because he suspected some of the Christians in Rome might be envious of his honor as a martyr. <laughs> Imagine someone writing a letter like that today, right? For Ignatius, suffering was a great honor and martyrdom demonstrated that he was worthy of that honor. But secondly, the Christians who helped Ignatius, Ignatius on his way to Rome were equally honorable. Ignatius says to the believers who visited him in person, quote, You did not despise my shame, nor were you ashamed of them, nor will the perfect hope of Jesus Christ be ashamed of you. When the church in Ephesus sent a deacon to accompany Ignatius, he considered that gesture a mark of honor for which, quote, The Lord Jesus Christ would honor them. The believers did not fear the shame of associating with the condemned bishop, Ignatius, but they eagerly su supported and extended hospitality to him. Helping Ignatius in his march toward martyrdom was honorable because such a death brought honor to God. Ignatius makes two important points about suffering. Martyrdom for Christ brought honor, and believers who extend hospitality to martyrs enjoy similar honors. Ignatius's redefinition of suffering and persecution offers some real pastoral encouragement to global Christians who face similar shame today. And finally, regarding eschatology, we look at C.S. Lewis, who is a literature professor and Christian apologist in 20th century England. His essay sermon, The Way of Glory, speaks of the eschatological realities of honor and glory. Lewis first observes how honor and glory are central in biblical salvation. He says, There is no getting away from the fact that this idea of glory is very prominent in the New Testament and early Christian writings. Salvation is constantly associated with palms, crowns, white robes, thrones, and splendor like the sun and stars. The Bible describes the eschatological inheritance of Christians in terms of honor. But nevertheless, these biblical realities of our glory really confounded C.S. Lewis. His intellect wanted to explain them away as puzzling or repulsive. He said, glory suggests two ideas to me. One is wicked and the other is ridiculous. But Lewis came to understand honor as the very gift we humans covet the most. Glory, as Christianity teaches me to hope for it, turns out to satisfy my original desire. Honor and shame define the end of history, thought Lewis. And he says, quote, In the end, that face which is the delight or the terror of the universe must be turned upon each of us, either with one expression or another, either conferring glory inexpressible or inflicting shame that can be never cured or disguised. In the end, such glory really captured C.S. Lewis's heart and mind. The eschatological inclusion and glory satisfies the deepest groaning of our souls. And he says, quote, Apparently, then, our lifelong nostalgia, our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we have always seen from the outside is no mere neurotic fancy, but the truest index of our real situation. And to be at last summoned inside would be both glory and honor beyond our merits and also the healing of that old ache. Eschatological glory climaxes with divine approval. He says the promise of glory is the promise, almost incredible and only possible by the work of Christ, that some of us, that any of us who really chooses, shall actually survive that examination and find approval and shall please God. Lewis's eschatology avoids current events and timelines, and he instead features the beauty of glory and the terror of shame. The weight of glory captures the essence of Christian eschatology, the full revelation of God's glorious honor to his people. 
This brief tour through historical theology shows that honor and shame is clearly not something new. There has been theological reflection on the topic over the centuries. But regrettably, these reflections were largely independent. The theologians did not build on the work of previous authors, and there was very little intergenerational conversation between them. And so without collaboration, most of these historical gems have remained hidden. But nevertheless, their reflections show remarkable depth and insight. The theologians articulate key doctrines in terms of honor and shame, and this testifies to the centrality of honor and shame in biblical truth and the human experience. As you process these insights from historical theology, I offer you two questions to discuss and reflect. One, in what areas would you like to develop an honor-shame theology? And two, what insights from historical theology did you find most interesting and helpful? Well, thank you for listening to this webinar, Honor and Shame in Historical Theology. Good day.